Okay, so I, 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 I just asked Rebecca how long she wanted us to talk for, how long you were expecting us to talk for. The answer is half an hour. And, Good. Uh, and, then, and then we'll have questions. So uh, don't hesitate to uh, interrupt. So I, I should maybe say a tiny bit about myself first. Uh, I'm Charles Somerset Smith. I was at the National Portrait Gallery and then at the National Gallery. I mean, he was artist in residence at the National Gallery in 1984, long mm. before I was there. Uh, and then I was Secretary and Chief Executive at the Royal Academy. And Hugh, when did you, I should remember when you became an academician. I should remember when I became an academician as well. Um, 2006, you uh, were there before I arrived. I, I was, I think it was 2007, Charles. I okay, think maybe, maybe we arrived at more or less the same we time. We did, I think. Yeah. Uh, Nick Grimshaw was there for a year or so, I think, okay. and then you. You're right. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so that's how we know one another. I mean, mm. I thought I would start actually by getting here to talk about the studio, just because we're sitting in rather an amazing space, and I think it would be useful for people to have a feel first for the studio and then for the work which is on display. Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. And first, uh, welcome to everybody. Come in here because this is our home when we're in London, as well as. Um, as um, my studio and my long-suffering wife Claire has to put up with it being a studio and she said to me when we first moved here I'm never going to live in this place that was 15 years ago um, so uh, actually it, but just before he <laughs> said it's incredibly nice and highly desirable it is now <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is now yeah um, so it's a it's a very unusual building, and when I saw it um, first, I thought I couldn't work out the scale of the building because the roof was dark brown, the ironwork was blue, it had about 13 sofas in it, and I thought, is, what size is that building? But when I came into it, I immediately thought, wow, this is in London, uh, for a painter to have a, build, a building like this with... Um, potential for natural light in Greenwich, which is a really sort of real place, Greenwich. It's a real interesting um, neighbourhood. In fact, I didn't know quite how interesting it was. We'd always lived in South London, so I had that sort of um, thing about it. It's an old chapel, as I understand, chapel that was possibly a Sunday school. Um, it's gone through a number of changes. The ironwork, which I was particularly drawn to, is the state-of-the-art railway um, off-the-peg architecture from the 1840s, 50s. Um, and I've tried, we've tried to retain that feel of that ghost-like structure of the building. And it does affect what you do as an artist, the place where you are, the building you're in. Um, and um, my work uh, evolved I don't have technique, and I don't have style, and I don't have, um, uh, it, my work is driven by subject matter, and um, I try to discover new ways of doing things. And these paintings uh, are paintings, um, and they are all made, most of them in the last year, some of them slightly earlier, but kind of evolved of my work um, and they're about my own history and about this place so um, so the architecture does uh, interest me and it's probably uh, manifest in its most explicit form in the three pic pictures which you're all not looking at <laughs> which are behind you uh, I have a kind of I have a slightly perverse <laughs> aspect of mine yeah. but anyway but we can talk about them and you can look at them later you don't have to twist your necks but i just thought i'd mention that because there's a kind of an architecture in so those these are, uh, real scenes I imagine. these are are pictures of deptford creek right. which is near here and they're a landscape of fact they're absolutely factual and they are originate from my mobile phone um but they've been transformed in a sense. The Deptford Creek is um, a river that flows into the Thames. It's tidal, 
And so I was, um, during lockdown, I, I took on another studio in Deptford, um, uh, which was an interesting building uh, called Fuel Tank in Deptford. And I used to walk every day to this place and met nobody in the street. Or if I did, they were masked and they were, it, was a, it was quite a strange... Um, you, you were here all the way through? Yeah, so. through that. So this scene, and they're not picturesque, but it's about lockdown. And it's, about, um, it's about the, uh, the archaeology of the river, really, because when you look at them, they uh, have, you can see the, the sky and you can see the earth and you can see the water and you can see the a actual vertebrae of the city of London so, and, the, and the architecture, the way the, um, the walls have been formed around the river. And um, they have a kind of Dickensian feel to them, which is, but we do have one person looking at a mobile phone right in the center of the middle one. Um, and that's my first picture of somebody with a mobile phone. But turning um, their back to you? No, they're looking at, uh, looking at their phone. They're looking at the phone. So the paintings are called Creek. And um, they're more sculptural and photographic than painterly because they, they're made on sandbags, which are joined together. And the sandbags... Um, they traditionally used to dam rivers or to, as, so, um, but they're made, uh, they have Straight this kind of grid. Straight on to, not treated. Uh, well, they're prepared and treated right. and uh, sandbags and inside the sandbags are the newspapers of, of the day, of right. the, whatever day that was. So they're kind of a time capsule. So you're expected, the viewer is expected to have a feel for the material. Well, um, the viewer is expected to, is ho it's always hoped that the viewer connects with something um, in a way. And, uh, you know, sometimes the van delivery guys come in here and or women and say, oh, I like that. That's interesting. And um, it's, it's very much about this place, which is Deptford, uh, Greenwich. But, but uh, no, yeah. I can now ask you, because, yeah. I mean, in, in preparing for this, I've now found out a lot about Tui, which I didn't previously know. Between... Yeah. Um, All good, I hope, Charles, yeah. 70, <laughs> you, you went to... You were at Leeds. Were you, did you do painting at Leeds? I didn't, no, I didn't. I trained as a teacher, originally. Okay. At, um, and then you had, like, ten years doing painting? Um, well, I was painting all the time. Right. Um, but I, so were you teaching as well? I was a teacher for these, six, so these six are years. These missing years. So, well, so six years. I was a full-time teacher, right. and I didn't. I didn't get. I didn't go to art school in that way. I mean, later I went to Goldsmiths um, uh, to do a master's degree, but I didn't actually get the art school thing at the right. at the start, which but I have to know, say I'm use, grateful the for, for. The reason for asking. <laughs> yes is that I read that in the 70s, you were using material yeah. just as material, yes. so that there yeah. was a, it was only about the material, not yes. about... Yes, yes, yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean, I think when an art, a young artist wants to become a... Um, you know, all artists want to be relevant, and so sooner or later they get bored with imitating other artists, and they start looking at what, what's current and at that time there's only conceptual art really or something that was called formalism and um, it was the driest era of it was a very dry yeah. era yeah <laughs> you couldn't you couldn't really get away with anything um, and, and that forms you and so um, I used a lot of found material because I wanted to make large work and I was I didn't have any money so the only way I could do that was by using poor materials so I, I, what I used to do was I used to use the draw, the paper that r came to wrap the drawing paper that my school children used. So I used this, okay. I laminated it together and preserved it like 
some archaeological artifact um, and made the pictures that rolled up, a bit, a bit like what I'm doing now. Um, yeah, and that was the reason for asking. Uh, it feels yes, like... Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. That, was the, that was an initial thing. And so there's a, there's a kind of a revisitation of that. Um, most people probably know my my large-scale oil paintings on a, on a fixed canvas, yeah. which are hugely difficult to move around, they're very d easily damaged, that, you know. So there was a kind of liberation to, to the use, use of... These will be in your material. show at Marlborough. These three will be, yeah. Unframed. Unframed, yeah. So, so the materiality and the... Yeah. yeah. They're kind of a sculptural thing. But, um, but this feels like a, I mean, maybe... It is an effect of lockdown. It feels like a departure because yeah. they are realistic. They're, yes, they're, yeah. They're not exactly landscapes because they're. Well, landscape. it's, a, it's a departure. It's the landscape of fact, but yeah. it's obviously it's been changed. Yeah. And uh, the sandbags is. Sandbags were never designed to have paintings made on them. So it, you, you present yourself with a problem and. Um, in a way, that something uh, about them that is a bit like a suit of armor, or you know, a jade princess from ancient China, or whatever. It's about it's about segments of an image. So you you see an object, but you also see an image. And uh, what I'm interested in is that tension between the uh, between the actual thing, which is a which is a sandbag and the image. And so I don't expect anything really from the viewer, but um, the contract, the artist contract is to do what they, what fascinates them and in a way. But there seems to be urban dereliction. The, I mean, as, this area has been developed. It's as, very, as the city <laughs> it's a becomes. very trendy area. If you want to buy a <laughs> flat there, this is just outside Waitrose. It's I, really... I, I live north of the river and I'm interested <laughs> in the in urban topography. So, so it seems to me this is a... It feels Dickensian. Yeah. In fact, uh, David Mack said that to me. He came right. in, he, he said, well, I, w I won't tell you what, what he said prior to that. There was a number of expletives, but Dickensian okay. <laughs> was involved in it. Um, and... Uh, it, but well, I suppose my interest is a slight timelessness about it, that it's like, this is like the same as it would have looked like a hundred years ago um, for all. And also the fact that central London was devoid of people. Um, and this is a creek and the expression up the creek. In fact, one of the successful comedy shows was Shit's Creek, I believe, of uh, the, <laughs> the uh, lockdown. So well, it's the, seen it says high. Why, why does it say high? It's the high water mark, I think, oh, isn't it? Okay. Right. But um, so it's. But the point is, it's if it arouses curiosity, um, then it, it serves its purpose. But, but this issue, David, David Mack, you probably know, is sculptor, hmm. same generation friend. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I got to know David at, actually at the Royal Academy. Right. Really. Yeah. So, so he's the person who did um, big tower of things. He makes things out he collages of things. Collages. He does, yeah, yeah. But his expletive would presumably be because you, you do the opposite to what everybody else does. I don't know, but I took it as a positive. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah but it, it seems to me, you know, well, mm. well let's talk about, so mm. 1982, you went yep. to Goldsmiths. Goldsmiths. 1980. I finished 1980. in 82. Okay. Yeah. So Goldsmiths was Michael Craig Martin and the, the yeah. place where um, Damien Hurst and yeah. his generation all were. Mm. And, and you, the moment you went to Goldsmiths, you decided to do grand history painting. So <laughs> <laughs> Perverse streak there, Charles. Well, well that, yeah. that, that, that... Well, that, not, not quite, but I, I, right. I take your point. Um, at the, in, when I went to Goldsmiths, um, Michael actually was in New York at the time. He was on a fellowship, and John Thompson was there. Who was John very, was inspirational? Or he, was, he was a great teacher, John. Right. John came up to see me, and um, uh, he um, brought me down to London, really. And um, I was... 
and I learned a lot at Goldsmiths. I learned a lot about how to, um, I, that you needed to know exactly what you're doing as an artist, is what I learned at Goldsmiths. There's a lot of uh, intellectual discourse, a lot of, uh, of theorising, but I knew I wanted to be a painter, and I looked at what people did rather than what they said. Now, at the end of my time at Goldsmiths, I knew I wanted to, to express myself through the idiom of painting. Not that that in itself, being a talented painter, was of any... Uh, because I think, really, painting is... The, the ambitious painter wants to make a painting that nobody else has made. That's what they want to do. So you can only um, learn so much from the tradition. But after leaving Goldsmiths, what was catalytic was in 1984, I was appointed artist in residence at the National Gallery. You were and the part second? of the brief. No, I was no. later than that. I was Maybe. after. Um, Maggie Hambling. Maggie Hambling was the one that was known. Maggie yeah. and Jock, I think, was okay, before Jock, me. Yeah, I uh, right. But. But um, I took that very, very seriously. And, um, you had a studio in the building. Studio in the yeah. building. And um, I looked every day at this repository of the... Um, you get a staff pass so you can yes, go up before the public. Yes, you <laughs> do. You do, which is great. And uh, well, that was an amazing thing. And I recognised that it was an amazing thing. And I realised that I needed to... So I used to work till 8 o'clock every night, um, which wasn't terribly popular with the security people, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than Liz and Freud, who would yeah. insist on coming in at One o'clock in the morning, yes. <laughs> yeah. well. Not the day I ever saw him. <laughs> I was never there. To... That was his... Uh, well, yeah. yes. So it was, no, it was, that was an amazing thing. And I suppose that was catalyst in right. my um, development as an artist, and I suppose I developed an interest, particularly at the National Gallery in Titian, in late Titian. Um, because there was the, what, the Venetian exhibition, which had the... Venetian Titian exhibition was, was at the RA, it was actually yeah. at the RA. Yeah. And it, the, the great Titian that came out of that was uh, the Flaying of Marsis, which had never been shown in, um, before, Fair, or even photographs in the RA catalogue in a black and white reproduction. Yeah. It's in from Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And uh, so that was very, very... So I, I made a lot of figure paint, paintings of the human figure that were about the idea of how you make, make the figure out of paint, which is different from the English tradition, which is sitting down with somebody sat in a chair in front of you and copying the... the drawing them. I was interested in the idea of making something out of paint, almost like a, like a golem, like some sort of um, magical thing. Um, and how much was the new spirit in painting? Were you aware of that? I was uh, aware, totally aware of it, yes. Yeah. I was interested in Baselitz and so, Kiefer. So the both new of spirit in painting yeah. was uh, yeah. an exhibition also at the RA in 1981, where I, I still think, and I see no reason to dispute the fact, suddenly, after the 70s, which were a very mm. de dry decade of mm. conceptual art, suddenly big expressionism and the idea of subject matter and yes. painting as painting came back, mm. which presumably gave you courage and confidence. Well, it was a great moment. It was great. You could see it was a, it was a green light for a painter um, mm. that all of a sudden... Because part of the problem is the gate holders, the gatekeepers, the um, critics uh, who decide what is um, what is possible and what isn't poss possible. Because they they hold um, all of a sudden, painting was fashionable. I, I never can never work out whether it's best for it to be in fashion or out of fashion. It doesn't <laughs> doesn't um, is it doesn't. The critics or, or next rota? Nick Sorota was the co-director, co-curator well, co of... Nick Sorota uh, used to, to um, run the Whitechapel Open Exhibition. Yeah. And my work was selected for that and given pride of place. So I don't think Nick Sorota was, was anti-painting. and I think, no, he, no, but, uh, I think he had I mean a particular is, eye, he, actually. If, yeah. you're, if you're talking about how is it that things go in fashion and out of fashion... Mm. 
which, of course, nobody knows for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My view would be it isn't really the critics, because mm. the critics are just responding. They write every yeah. week according to what's on display. Yeah. So that the key individuals in making decisions as to yeah. what should be on display, uh, uh, mm. I, I don't include myself, I don't, never felt I had mm. that power. <laughs> But uh, um, New Spirit in Painting mm. was Nix wrote and Norman Rosenthal yes. getting yeah. together and saying there's a movement which we should show and represent. Yes. Well, I think, I think certain people ha hold levers. Yeah. They're very, very powerful levers and they can do that. And I think other people then follow and you get, you get uh, a following. And all of a sudden, in early 1980, somebody decided that painting was okay and uh, that it, that it wasn't, it was uh, wasn't okay. a it was crime more, any longer. It was the central activity. Practicing. Yes, yes. And so it became possible to be a painter. Um, and that, I think I was very fortunate in a way that that coincided with my um, emergence from um, goldsmiths and what have you. And, what have you, and so I, um, I grasped that with, um, with two hands, but what I didn't grasp was the overriding sense that everything had to be ironic, that everything was a joke. Uh, that was true of architecture. I don't think that was true of painting. I think I mean, it was true painters, of painting. The big German painters. Well, it's not true. The, well, well, exactly. I think the key German. word there is German. Yeah. Anselm Kiefer is a yeah. great artist. Yeah. Um, and he's not ironic. He's uh, about, no, he isn't he's ironic. Myths. But they, they actually accused him of being ironic at the start. Okay. Right. Uh, a lot of the discourse around it was that he was ironic. He reinvented... Um, subject matter in painting almost single-handedly. And, yeah. and then the traffic lights somehow changed yes. in about 1990. And I don't mm. know what your view is of the... Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, that's absolutely true. And f the problem is, as an artist, you can't deal with fashion. Um, that's just fashion. Um, all of a sudden, you know, the fashion is changing now. You know, all of a sudden, you know, you might be deemed to be out of fashion or in fashion or what have you. <laughs> but that's... So you just carry on fairly... What, e what else could you, could you do, yeah. really, yeah. realistically? So, uh, but, that's... but when you talk a bit about... Um, uh, and then it's quite soon, I realise I'm going to ask everybody mm. else to ask questions. So, so when were you taken on by Marlborough? Um, I moved to Marlborough from... You were with Purdy Hicks. I was it? with Purdy Hicks. I left yeah. Purdy Hicks. I was with James yeah. Hyman for three right. years, and then I moved right. to Marlborough. I can't quite remember when that was. I think it was 2000. And I don't know. I've done, I've done three shows or four shows with okay. Marlborough. So I've been there so, for so, a while. So there yeah. isn't a sense where the Gary, a Gary, has supported you all the way through? Uh, definitely not, yeah. Um, and, and actually... I mean, I'm asking mm. you questions, yeah. but uh, I'm, I'm going to mm. be true to what I said at the beginning, get other people to ask you. When, when you say a bit about Ireland, yes. and you spend half, normally spend half the year in Ireland? I do, yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I suppose some of the imagery, in the, the, the main imagery, the ship, in the painting, um, I saw... Uh, it, it, first in 1962, um, it's on a little island called Inishia, um, the small island just off the coast of Galway. Um, and uh, I saw it in August 1962, and it had only just been wrecked then. And I've gone back to it. So it's kind of, a, amongst many other things, it's an emblem of identity, because I was taken there by my father... Uh, who'd seen the documentary Man of Aaron by, um, it's one of the, well, it's often cited as the first documentary with uh, Nanook of the North. It's not really a documentary. It's a kind of, um, it's a sort of 
an imaginative film about life on this, this remote islands. And uh, my father took us there because um, he'd been he'd excited about this. And it was a very magical journey. And so it probably, in a very powerful way, connected me with Ireland. And so the, the, the ship is a symbol of that. And it was wrecked there in 62. It's still there. Then it was a kind of a large black and white ship. Now it's a great rusting phosphorescent red. Looks like a sculpture by Anthony Caro on the beach. It's still legible as a ship. Oh, it's still there, still okay. there, yeah. And it was, a, it, was a, it was built as an armed trawler for the, for the Royal Navy in 1940. And so, it's, it was in the Second World War, it was in the North Sea, and it was in Tor Operation Torch in, in the Mediterranean. Then at the end of the war, um, there was the, the, the bottom fell out of the market in armed trawlers, and it, became, it was redundant, so they made it a tramp steamer. And then it was worked for a few years under one name, and then it was bought by the Limerick Steamship Company. And... It was a tra tramp steamer, meant it went, travelled wherever it was needed to take one thing to another, and it was wrecked on a night in 1960. So it has this very profound history of its interconnectivity between Ireland and England. And, um, but for me, it's a motif that I've returned to, gone back to, and uh, made paintings of it. Um, made drawings of it, but uh, these works are um, take, adapted from photographs that I've taken over the years, and they, it's... This is much more legible, hmm? if one's allowed right. to use that phrase. <laughs> right. I mean, because this on the right is more common, where it's a sort of abstracted symbol. Well, um, I find that difficult to, to, to understand, really, because I know it so well. Um, that the symbol of the ship, the kind of leviathan that's sort of towering over you, it's kind of slightly, has all sorts of overtones. It's a bit like a medieval visor or helmet. Of a, it's, it has some of its military um, history is still there. Um, it's made on tarpaulin. And so the tarpaulin kind of mirrors the, um, the plates of the ship. And it's an object, as well as being an image, it's an object. And um, so it's, it's um, uh, you know, in a way I don't, I can't judge what another person sees in the painting. I can only make my painting. But um, the... The thing I suppose I should say about all these paintings is they're made on, quite deliberately, on repurposed materials. On, this is... On, they're all on tarpaulin. On, um, it's an industrial scale, and they're meant to feel industrial. Um, and um, so, old-fashioned tarpaulin. Now we're going to have some questions from the audience. Sure. sure. So, uh, questions from the audience. Graham is about to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Um, Thank as you. an artist who's always been known as a sort of a very painterly painter, who, you know, using lots of impasto and yeah. quite abstract images, okay. is it difficult, um, both artistically and also in terms of worrying about how people will, will respond, to start incorporating photographs in paintings mm. and then actually getting to the point where with the three behind us they are effectively mm. more photograph mm. in mm. some ways than painting. Mm. Um, I think you said is it difficult? Yes it's difficult um, but at the end of the day an artist has to do what they want to do. Most Many artists get stuck in a, in a repetitious cycle of repeating themselves, and they do things because they can do them. Um, and because the art market encourages them. That's, yes, yes, that's a terrible trap. Um, 
So I take it as very, um, it's a brave thing to change what you do, particularly if what you've been doing earlier has been successful and to change it to do something else. Um, so what I do is I try to do what excites me and it doesn't always work. Some things that uh, don't work out. But if you think about it, and I've thought a lot about photography, I mean, photography has been in painting for more than 200 years, but if you think about it, would these pictures be better if I'd spent months and months and months carefully drawing them? They wouldn't be better. In fact, they'd probably be worse because that art always goes by the quickest route, in my view. It's like water. It goes by the most direct route. And basically, what I'm saying is the recognition of something. We're all accustomed to reading photographic imagery, particularly younger people. They come in, they read it. And uh, people sometimes say silly things like, that must have taken you ages to do. Well, yeah, it did, but that's irrelevant. Um, what it is, is it's, a, it's an image. And I've separated the uh, process of, um, of making the image from the process of making the work of art. Um, so it, there's, the, the works are driven by an idea rather than here is me demonstrating skill to you. I can do this, I can draw this, I can do that. Well, that's show off art I don't, I don't believe in. And um, so photography is here in a, in a, in a big way. What, what I'm looking at when I make a work of art is do, am I convinced by it? And I'm not always convinced by what I do. And I edit a lot of what I do. I try and edit um, work. Um, but I also try and do things that surprise me. So I, I, I try not to look over my shoulder and um, try to do what feels right. Yes. Okay. How difficult was it for you to retain your resolve in your interest in painting in the period in the 90s when supposedly painting was considered to be dead amongst people like Nick Sirota, right. <laughs> who, you know, there was this mm. very sort of this mad wave of, of conceptual art, an interest in conceptual and installation art, and you retained your passion and determination to paint. And how hard was it to, to stick with that in that uh, um, It just, it is more difficult, but it is more difficult to be visible, I'd say. But it, it, my passion was not any um, diminished. Um, I mean, I first... You, you carried on selling. I, I mean, did. That's a, that, that's a, <laughs> but I that's did, not yes. an insignificant thing, in my yes. view. That no. Paddy Hicks showed you, you, yes. you were still known Absolutely. as somebody who was a painter. Yeah. I've had very, very loyal and very good collectors. And that's been um, absolutely fantastic. And I've been able to survive, which is, um, is an incredible thing, really, when you think about it. Um, because, you know, I grew up in a working class housing estate in South Manchester. There's no tradition of, you know, being artists there. Um, yeah, I've made my living for since 1983 I think so um, as a painter solely and I'm very very grateful for that but it does have pressures and uh, to to address the question yeah it's kind of it means that museum shows are, are, are rarer to come by because of all the attention's gone off to showing this kind of art they're not showing that kind of art it becomes more difficult but I've had really, really, really passionate and loyal supporters um, who've, who've believed in what I have done and, um, and I'm very grateful to them, including yourself. That was the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <we> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Sue. Yeah. Yeah. 
She did at the Haywood. Where, where where was it? Well, the Haywood, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, which was, you know, taken from Seymour Viles, and, right. uh, you know, and um, whether I'm just just in my mind questioning whether the, you know, I mean, there's all this, you know, crap over painting is dead, but I'm not sure the painting ever was dead. I mean, in mm. all the years that I. Yeah, it, it carries um, on. It carries on. But, yeah. And it seems to me that perhaps that tradition of John Thompson, Gravity and Grace, Seymour Vile, which I know would sort of touch on your work. And also you mentioned Kiefer, and I can so see Kiefer. Including know, in these... Yes, discussion yeah. Yeah. In, in, in your work. That actually you sort of continue to paint more within a European tradition than an than a English tradition. You're not Euston Road, you're not London School. You're no. Yeah. Well, that was behind my question about Ireland, but he, he I, mean, I mean, because it seems to me Ireland does things somewhat differently. I mean, its Gary scene is a bit different, the collectors are different, people can have different reputations in Dublin from in London. So I wondered whether, in a sort of way, going to Ireland was a way of... Yeah, so I was, but I was thinking very much more of the sort of people like Kiefer, who are history yeah. painters, and you know, the role mm. of history in, in Hugh's work. And I don't see that in either, you know, your real immersion of knowledge uh, uh, of certain, you know, the two world wars and interest in that. I don't see that immersion in history in other British painters. Yeah. It seems more European. Basilitz does it. Okay, yeah. more well, Kiefer does it. German. There's, a, there's a, a, a question at the back. I sorry. suspect a comment Michael, as sorry. much as it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Boats, ships, dinghies yeah. exist in the public consciousness now. Yeah. And conscience. Yes. Boats, ships. Yes. Why? Well, um, probably because of they're a, they're a, a perennially um, recurring image, and they're quite tragic. There's been a lot of um, boats on the Mediterranean bringing um, immigrants across in tra tragic circumstances. So there is a subliminal reference to that yeah. in these works. Yeah. Um, I don't make those references obviously, no. but it's a wreck that's, it's, you know, you would not need to be a particular master mariner to work out that this ship is not seaworthy. Um, it's a wreck that's been, and, and of course that is, it's absolutely in the, in the current um, um, memory, you know, these, these tragic images that of, of migrants and, uh, but I've, I've never addressed, or rarely have I addressed things very directly in my work. I, 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 it's subliminal. Um, in one way, it's just the Plassey. It's just, just what it is. But it's how I see the Plassey. It has a kind of, um, some of these pictures, it looks like you're, you're in the sea. <laughs> you know, and the ship's heading away from you, and you, you know, you're adrift, and it's... Um, and, and some of them are called Adrift, some of them are called Wake, uh, Creek. A lot of the titles are quite sort of, um, you know, they're, they're about the human predicament. Mm. So there is that in it. I think, uh, Sue, your point about German art, I think the Germans had to really address, it's kind of curious, the Second World War, and they have done, German art has really addressed Second one hasn't addressed the First World War, curiously enough. 
Yeah, but Kiefer definitely opened up that um, subject matter about the memory of uh, the collective memory of people. That's that's a subject I have the same. When I saw Kiefer's work in the early eighties, um, I understood that immediately. That what what this was about was about this 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 monster in the closet of every, every German born in that you know that time who opens the closet, finds their, their parents, what were they doing? You know, where, what were they, what were they up to? You know, that's, hey. sorry. Two quick questions. Are yep. you drawn at all to teaching young people? Are you drawn to engage other people in the journey that you have started? Question one. Question two. Have you ever been on the ship? Yes, is the answer to the second question. Yes, I've do, been do on it. Do you go on those RA boating trips around the coast of Ireland with Norman Eckroyd? I nearly did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I nearly did. It's a slightly odd thing I only discovered that, that uh, every summer Norman Eckroyd takes a boat and he goes does. around the coast of West Ireland with a gang of... He does, he does, and uh, I, I nearly got... Uh, Norman's <laughs> a very good friend of mine, and I, I'm sure I will get on, on one of them. So the answer is, yeah, have I been on the Plassey? Yes. <coughs> I was on it <coughs> a number of times, only when it was wrecked. Um, but I've been in the hold of the Plassey, and I've been up on deck in the Plassey, and um, I'll go back and see the Plassey again, please God. Um, so yes, on the question of, of education, I've been a teacher and um, I, I am interesting, interested in communicating uh, my thinking about art and about, um, and, and passing on what information I can to a younger generation. Yes, I am absolutely interested in that. I tend not to, I do, uh, talks and lectures on a re fairly regular basis um, and uh, when I do I tend to make them about something quite specific specific idea um, and um, uh, yeah so yes but, but here yes. I suspect there's a question hovering and we'll ask this and then we'll finish and okay. go into having and a have drink informal and questions informal discussion <laughs> yes but there was a moment where you said things are about to change again and and I, I mean I'd be rather interested in your views to in uh, in art yes in art I, I thought when you were talking there was a moment mm. where you know, as we've discussed, things did change quite dramatically in the attitude yeah. to art, in what was legitimate in 1980. And they changed again, probably, yes. in 1990. And then I'm not conscious or confident, I wouldn't say that things had changed in quite the same way, mm. quite so evidently, mm. since then. But on the other hand, we've had... 18 months of COVID. Yes. And things do change. Attitudes change. Yeah. You get a new generation, their interests are different. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'll be more. I, you know, is it possible that people might get interested in subject painting again? I think so. I think the effect of COVID and this will be to make people more serious yeah. about art. Uh, I think less, art less has ironic. become. Less joking. Less, ir less ironic. Well, if you think about irony, what irony, what it came from, as I right at the start, it, it, it comes from 1917. Uh, there's a moment in 1917 when the French army, it's called the Nivelle Offensive. They go over the top, the Nivelle Offensive. This is after the Battle of Verdun, after the Somme. And the French army advanced at... Um, in the Nivelle Offensive. They go out of the trenches and they walk forward and they started making noise, parody of sheep going to the slaughter. Now that is, that is irony. About, about their, their fate. It's, it's to within, escape too much reality. It was in, yeah, it was in the popular... It was a, 
Dissidency mechanism. Absolutely. It's a, ter it's a terrible thing. Marcel Duchamp's work, Fountain, was made in exactly the same point. He was a Frenchman living in New York when this was taking place. And he picked up the, the, the zeitgeist of it. And to answer your question, yes, I think that there will be a change. It's about more seriousness. I think part of the problem is the art schools, which that is a whole other ballroom, because I think the art schools have largely been destroyed. Um, uh, not that I, I, I didn't really go to art school, but I've been an outside observer. I've taught in art schools. Um, but there used to be places where people could experiment instead of learning about cultural theory. They could, they could make mistakes, they could make a mess, they could become themselves and become artists. And I think that has been, they're now sort of like some weak, um, you know. Training course in critical theory. Exactly, how, <laughs> how dull is that? And I think that one of the, the changes that may come will come from grassroots level, come from uh, young people not wanting to be fobbed off and they'll want to learn about art. And, and they're quite right to want to learn skills, painterly skills. Um, if they want to draw something and something, great, get out there, but know why you're doing it and what the reason is why you're doing it. And it should be a good, good reason and it should be your reason. So I think there will be change, yes. Uh, okay. I hope they will. We're going to drink to that <laughs> okay. and drink okay. to hear it. And thank okay. him very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank <laughs> you. Sorry. Sorry, the lights have only just gone on. The lights are going down and down. It's getting darker and darker.